of the map. The first transactional website uh, uh, that was fully operational online, uh, I, I know we were one of the first because I was there the day a hacker uh, got through our website over our firewall and terminated almost all of our uh, 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 receivable files in our system. We, we did recover, but it was, uh, it was a bad day for marketing at Gateway 2000. Um, but I've been through four revolutions in my career. I did not, by nature, intend to be a marketing guy. I actually was doing a PhD in cognitive language structures, trying to figure out where words were stored in the brain and how the brain recovered words uh, in, uh, in almost random sequences to interpret what was being said in their environment. And uh, in doing that, we became aware uh, or became, became conclu concluded that the brain actually encrypted language, but it encrypted in random cellular structures. And what would happen was connections between words would be uh, constructed by the brain in response to the number of times two words appeared in the human environment. So that good boy, which words I rarely heard but heard enough, uh, eventually became linked, and they were linked by a neural pathway that could be very, very long in total distance, uh, where each cell would release chem chemicals at the, at the synapse uh, that would excite the next cell. And through that sequence, the two words would find each cell, each other, and the more the, two, the, the, two, the pathway was exercised through repetition, the more efficient it became. Uh, and it was the, the search for language that in some ways animated my childhood and yours as well. And more than that, a search that eventually arrived at a point where a sequence of words could be arrayed in your life that had never been heard before and could be linked through neural nets in a matter of, of uh, nanoseconds and understanding would occur without any other referential image than the language you just heard, it's heard itself and within what we call the cortical thematic cause, you could be formulating a response. It is an amazing thing, the human brain, uh, from an information processing point of view. We were looking very carefully at these structures and uh, finding that we couldn't explore the impact of new words without finding that they'd already been conjoined with old words. And so we began to experiment on language uh, recovery and uh, recognition by using brand names some of which we invented, and some of which only meant one thing, such as Xerox. Xerox had not yet emerged as a synonym for reprographics. It was, it was by itself a brand. And in looking at brands, we discovered a lot about how language, uh, language formed and, and, uh, and was, was, was made recoverable. Um, it was during that experiment that we decided to elect a guy to Congress to show that it was easier to promote an innovation in cognitive, in the cognitive world by repetitiously saying one thing about it that links to people's sense of self than a lot of things, and especially things about change. It was better to deny that change was taking place with an innovation in the sense than it was to acknowledge that change was taking place. So we took this guy named Jim Blanchard, who was a um, uh, Assistant Attorney General in Royal Oak, Michigan. I was going to, I was going to Michigan State at the time in, uh, in the last year of my doctoral program. And um, we, uh, we ran him in a Democratic primary for Congress. And we instructed uh, Mr. Blanchard, who went on to become governor of Michigan and, and eventually uh, uh, an ambassador to Canada in, uh, in Clinton days, that he was to run on the following platform. I'm just like you. And no matter what question he was asked, he would always say, oh, school busting, I, have this, I, I share the constituency's point of view, I'm just like, I'm just like you. Uh, and to take no position other than the position that linked him as an innovation to people's sense of self. Uh, and he was elected, in fact, the percentage of distance, uh, cognitive distance, distance that we collapsed was an exact predictor of the percentage of vote he was to get. Now we got in a lot of trouble for doing a social experiment with 
uh, with the American electoral process. But we were able to demonstrate that innovations work not because people pursue change, but because they pursue themselves. When I came here four years ago with about 60 people and the idea of digital publishing sounded like a, uh, uh, just another way of publishing, I didn't realize at the time that we were talking about a revolution in the way people read. A revolution in the way people read sounds not a very big, like a, not a very big deal. Except that the ability to read is one of the basic architects of human success. It's one of the basic architects of uh, human self-esteem. And it's a privilege human beings reserve for themselves with respect to all other species. And it allows them to know things stored elsewhere without having to think about the processing system that makes it available. Digital publishing is going online in a way that we haven't really seen now since the early uh, or late 80s with the emergence of, uh, of, of, uh, of computer functioning, laptop functioning, uh, personal computer functioning, even Apple functioning beyond uh, the, the, the functions of, uh, of, of, of creating a story, uh, transmitting a story, um, creating a set of numbers on a spreadsheet. There's, there's very little that's changed in the functionality of machines except to get a little more efficient. We are now invading reading. We are now taking on a basic process of human communication that is far more important to people than, than, uh, than almost anything we've done with the computer today. It is reading, the revolutionary reading began with Gutenberg and the printing press that allowed everybody to engage. It was the predecessor for the, for the Renaissance at a time of enormous, uh, uh, enormous poverty in Europe. It was the thing that allowed people to go to sea to, to, to discover the colonies. It was a really critical event in the organization of progress in man's history. And it is a process people take very seriously. It's embedded in the Constitution. It's embedded in the Articles of the United Nations. The right to read is a fundamental process. And we are now proposing to dramatically uh, um, change the process of reading itself. Harrison Group spends a lot of time watching human beings unfold in this complicated world. I wanted to spend a few minutes this morning with that preamble telling you about what's going on in the economy and how it's affecting people. I wanted to then spend a few minutes looking at how people are responding with the media I then wanted to take a few minutes to talk about how people are responding now to social media. And, uh, uh, and some of this is not going to be, um, some of this will probably be heresy, some of it will be disappointing uh, in terms of the uh, value of advertising in this space. And then I wanted to suggest some ideas that could form at least some of the dialogue for the next, uh, for the next, for the next day and uh, into the next year. Uh, I'm going to quote from four surveys. We do an annual survey of affluence and wealth in America. It's basically the top 10% of the American economy, about 55% of all consumption. Uh, the average uh, household is about $275,000 of discretionary income in a range from about $100,000 discretionary to I think our top employed person this year made $9.5 million last year. Uh, we did about 2,500 interviews with affluent wealth households this year. We did a major recontact in, in September to see how people had changed over the course of the recession. And we did a study in, uh, in October with 1,500 interviews uh, from a panel we now run with American Express <coughs> Publishing, um, uh, a network media panel. I'm not going to give a lot of uh, specific information about what people do uh, on a daily basis uh, because I want to draw some conclusions about what we're doing. So let me start with the transforming economy. The recession uh, has been an obsession, if you will. But at the household level, it is changing the way America actually works. I reflected often on my father's experience with the, with the depression, uh, particularly so since he passed away last week. Uh, and I never forget, as a boy, the number of times the depression entered conversations as a criterion 
for evaluating what our family did. That the risk of it being repeated. My father basically was taken into the CCC when, uh, when he graduated from high school in 36. <coughs> he spent four years in the Civilian Conservation Corps building Lake Mead. And uh, in the, uh, I know this is not sort of a well-known historical fact, but the CCC was, was managed by General Marshall, who commanded U.S. Uh, US military affairs during this World War II. Marshall took all the CCC men and put them into the first peacetime draft and uh, basically took one expenditure on the federal budget and moved it over to a military expenditure. And my father then spent six years in the U.S. Army, meaning he was in the custody of the federal government for 10 years between 18 and uh, 28, basically. Uh, he never really forgot the lessons of the loss of his family farm. And um, this is a recession with, with very similar dynamics. In terms of just the affluent world, 1.4 million families have fallen out of it. When we look at why the consumption is so down, you've got a, you've got a, a huge loss of consumers uh, whose incomes and uh, whose livelihoods have been severely affected by this recession. Uh, the federal government is going to announce today that the recession is over. Uh, we are now pushing, on a real-time basis, 14% unemployment. And within that 14% unemployment, we've got 7% of, uh, of all housing in the country either, uh, either taken away uh, through foreclosure or in danger of doing so. Every one of our children now has a person in their class who has been displaced and disappeared. This has been a very severe, uh, severe uh, uh, event. Uh, but it's been very interesting for what it's done to consumers. So let, me, let me show you a couple things. First of all, for better or for worse, optimism is still very, very vacant. It's trending up slowly. We're at about 55% of the households we measure uh, uh, optimistic or extremely optimistic about their future. Only 46% are extremely or very optimistic about their child's future. And we suspect that's overhanging from the magnitude of current U.S. debt 